sure has been a blessing. I know, uh, I think every time I come, I get more out of it than I contribute. And I really appreciate you putting up with me and allowing me to come and, and let's see what the Lord might have for us. Sometimes you wonder if it can get any better, but I'll tell you what, one day it is going to get better. The, the best day you have down here is nothing to be compared to what it's going to be. The Bible says, I have not seen nor ear heard. Neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love Him. Amen. It's going to be something. Amen? Amen. All right, let's open up to Nehemiah chapter number 8. Nehemiah chapter number 8. We'll get right into it. Perfect timing for the message this afternoon because we're going to be dealing with consecrating your place. We started off with the condition of your place. It was in ruins in need of repair. We talked about construction of your place, rebuilding from the ground up. And last time we talked about the conflict over your place, relying on God's help <coughs> during conflict. Tonight we're going to talk about the consecrating of your place. You know, we've built some things on the outside, got a wall up. We've got a, we're kind of in a little camp bubble. Don't you like being in the camp bubble, summer camp bubble? You know, everything's kind of pushed out. You know, the world's kind of pushed out, and here we are. We just, you know, just us and Jesus. So now we've got our wall up, but now we've got to work on the inside and consecrate and get close to the Lord. You know, Paul said to the Ephesian elders when he left, in Acts chapter 20, he says, I commend you unto God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up. You need to be built up from the inside. And so we're going to look at this today. Nehemiah chapter number 8, we'll go ahead and start in verse 1. The Bible says, And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate. And they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday, before the men and the women, and those that could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood upon a pulpit of wood, which they had made for the purpose. And beside him stood Mattathiah, and Shema, and Ananiah, and Urijah, and Hilkiah, and Messiah on his right hand, and on his left hand, Padiah, and Misael, and Malchiah, and Hashem, and Hashpadana, Zechariah, and Meshullam. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And all the people answered, Amen, Amen, with lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also Jeshua and Bani and Sherebiah and Jamin, Akub, Shebathiah, Hadijah, Messiah, Kelta, Azariah, Jozebad, Hanan, Peliah, and the Levites caused the people to understand the law, and the people stood in their place. So they read in the book of the law of God distinctly, and gave the sense, and caused them to understand the reading. And Nehemiah, which is the Tershatha, and Ezra the priest, the scribe, and the Levites that taught the people, said unto all the people, This day is holy unto the Lord your God. Mourn not, nor weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink the sweet, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord. Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Amen. Pastor Gene Kim, will you pray and ask the Lord to bless the message for us, please? Father, thank you so much for being with us today. Amen. Thank you so much for being away from the world, the flesh, and the devil. Sometimes some of that can get in here, Heavenly Father. But thank you so much that your Holy Spirit moves in. Overall, that your Spirit was able to get the victory. Some of us were able to get the victory. Amen. Is that we fellowship, we worship, we hear your word, and we shout and we praise for your glory and for your honor. And you deserve more glory and honor, Father. So will you please fill within your creature, your Holy Spirit, so that you can get the honor and the glory 
Amen. Thank you. I'm sure you're familiar with Romans 12, where Paul says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We've got a wall around us. We've got some protection. But now it's time for us to consecrate our place. I want to give you four things that I believe will help us to be able to dedicate ourselves and to consecrate and to worship God in that inner sanctuary, in that holy of holies, that special place where it's you and Jesus. God has left us with all the tools we need. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad we don't have to rely on just church tradition? Aren't you glad we don't have to rely just on some type of ritual? Aren't you glad we don't have to rely just on hearsay? We can go to the source. We have all the tools we need. Verse number 1, they start off at the water gate. You'll notice back in chapter 3, the water gate didn't need repairing. It only needed revisiting. Paul says, I want you to cleanse you by the washing of the water, by the Word, Jesus said, rather. And so we have this Word of God, and I want to give you four things here that I think will help us to be able to consecrate that place of fellowship. Number one, if you want to consecrate your place of fellowship, it's going to be done through preaching. Through preaching. What is that? That is communication from God. Look, I know that God speaks to us when we read our Bibles. Uh, The very simple way to look at it is this. When you pray, you talk to God. When you read the Bible, God talks to you. But God has chosen to manifest His Word through preaching. And God will take a man and give him a message to mold you and to help you. I'm not here just to read a bunch of verses to you. I'm here to preach at you. You don't need some type of philosophy today. You don't need just some type of idea. You need the preaching of the Word of God. It wasn't Bible teaching that got a hold of my heart. It was preaching. Hey, I'm all about Bible teaching. I love to teach, and a pastor is supposed to teach. But we need preaching. We need somebody to point their hairy finger in our face and say, Thou art the man. And if you're going to consecrate that place inside of you, you need somebody to tell you how bad you are. You need somebody to tell you how to get right. You need somebody to tell you and to reprove you and to rebuke you and to exhort you. You don't need more Bible teaching. You don't even need more Bible knowledge stuffed into your head. Some of you, your heads are too big already. You need another hat to put on, to stretch it, to put it on your head. You need the preaching of the Word of God. There's something about God using a man to communicate His message to get to our hearts. I don't understand it, but I believe it. By the way, I like it. I like all types of preaching. I like it when it's calm, cool, and collected. And the preacher preaches and he's down like this and he's giving you a verse here and giving you a verse there and he, he says something kind of funny and you laugh and then he gives you a verse and it cuts you. Yeah. Yeah. Like, Whoa. And he's just going along talking, you know, never raises his voice and <laughs> little, like little razor blades. <laughs> I like it like that. And you know, sometimes I like a little bit of cotton candy preaching. You know what I'm talking about? I like camp preaching. You know, start talking about Jesus and Get a little bit of rhyme and rhythm. Bless God. Uh, hey, Jesus is my Savior. And I know that when He saved me, uh, He came down uh, and He met me uh, where I was. Uh, praise the Lord. Uh, and I know uh, that I can feel uh, His Spirit. Uh, I like it. I like it. Now, you can't live off cotton candy. But I like it. 
I like it hard. I like it soft. I like it smooth. I like it sweet. I like preaching. And you'll notice here in verses 1 to 6, we have the congregation... The wall and gate is probably behind Ezra here, so it's like a huge sounding board. You know how the acoustics work with those things. And the congregation is there. That's the first thing here, verses 1 to 6. And you want to realize the congregation, there had to be attendance. There had to be attendance. You say, uh, can you be a Christian without going to church? Well, yeah. But it's kind of a contradiction. It's like a soldier that's not in the army. It's like a student who doesn't go to school. It's like a citizen who doesn't participate in this society. It's like a salesperson with no customers, a captain with no ship. It's like a business person on a deserted island. It's like a tuba player without an orchestra. Or a politician who's a hermit. <laughs> if you're a Christian, you need to be in the congregation. What would we preachers do if we didn't have nobody to preach to? There's the congregation, they're in attendance, but notice also there's attentiveness. Verse number 5, there's respect for the Word of God. They stand up when Ezra opens up the book. Notice in verse number 6, there's response to the Word of God. I appreciate the fact that you throw the ball back. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah. I say something and you say, Amen. Amen. Yes. Or you say, Oh me. I like when it's responsive. Now look, I understand that some people are more quiet and different churches and different areas and different cultures sometimes, they don't throw the ball back and they sit and they think this is just how it's supposed to be and they don't understand. We're having a conversation here yes. between me, you, and the Lord. Amen. And every now and again, the devil tries to get in there and we push him out. Yes. <laughs> but see, you respond to the message. You know, we're not doing responsive reading. The Lord is in His holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before Him. Amen, amen, amen. 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 <laughs> but you respond. These people, they responded. When Ezra said something, they said, Amen! amen. Or Amen. I think they said amen. amen. And they lifted up their hands and they worshipped. You know, uh, I was about 16 years old when we got back in church. I was led to Christ when I was little. And my parents were in a good church and the church fell apart and I was too young to really remember. And we bounced from church to church. You know how it is. And finally, my mother ran into someone that said, hey, why don't you come to church? And so we came and I was 15, 16 years old and I was in the world playing my worldly music and the whole thing. You know, I was saved, but I sure wasn't surrendered to God. And we came there and week after week, Small church. The preacher would stand up and he preached like he was in front of a multitude. He got up and he'd preach his heart out. And it took week after week, month after month, and that preaching began to change me. Amen. 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 It wasn't somebody coming up, sitting down, trying to set me straight. It was none of that. It was the pulpit. It was the preaching that changed me. I thank God for preaching. There's a response. Notice in verse number 9, as a result of preaching, there's remorse. There's remorse. The people wept when they heard the words of the law. Notice also verse number 10, there's rejoicing. You know, you need to read the Word, you need to receive the Word, you need to rejoice in the Word. Thank God there can be remorse, but thank God there's rejoicing because you know what? When you bring your sins to Jesus, He takes them and He takes care of that. He's our advocate. John says, hey, He writes these things that we sin not. You're not supposed to be sinning out here. I don't know if you realize that or not. But He says, and if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ the righteous. And He's the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. There's remorse, but thank God there's rejoicing. You can rejoice in the Word of God. Jeremiah 15, 16, Jeremiah says, Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And Thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. Psalm 19, 8, The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Psalm 119, 11, 111. Thy testimonies have I taken as an heritage forever, for they are the rejoicing of my heart. 
Now, you might get some thrills in the world. You might get some pleasures in the world. The Bible says there's pleasures in sin for a season. But you're not going to find joy. Nehemiah says the joy of the Lord is your strength. There's remorse, there's rejoicing. Look in verses 14 to 18. There's remembrance. There's remembrance. They found written in the law that they're supposed to bring and build these booths for the Feast of Tabernacles and said, man, nobody's been doing this. So they go back to the point of reference and they say, you know what? We're going to remember what God told us to do and we're going to be obedient to what God said. This is consecration. Consecration is saying, you know what? I've pushed out some stuff that shouldn't be here. I've removed some rubbish that shouldn't be here. Now I can start doing the things I'm supposed to do. Here's what a lot of Christians get messed up. They keep the rubbish and try to rejoice with the rubbish. You can't rejoice with the rubbish. And you can't be obedient and be consecrated to Jesus Christ with sin in your life like that. And so the wall's got to be built. The place has got to be cleansed out. And he says that they came and they remembered and they obeyed. They obeyed. You know, it's good to have preaching that prompts you to do what God told you to do. You know, there's a lot of us here that got called to preach during preaching. God reaches out sometimes and tags us through preaching. God does something sometimes through preaching to get a hold of us. And I'm glad that He does. You say, well, preacher, you know, this thing can't last all the time and we can't have, be on the mountaintop all the time. I know you got to go back down in the valley But God will do some special things for you sometimes, just like today. And Billy Sunday was asked one time, they said, Preacher, does revival last? You know, does revival always last? He says, no, it doesn't always last. He goes, but neither does a bath. And you need a bath every now and again. Amen. You need a revival. It brings consecration. So we have the, obviously, we've got the congregation. But notice we've got the exposition and explanation. Verse number 8. Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen. We're lifting up hands. And he goes through here, and you'll notice that he stand, they stand in their place. In verse number 8, they read the book of the law distinctly, gave the sense, and caused them to understand the reading. I want to give you some things about preaching. Number one, preaching should be dynamic. It should be dynamic. And I know these preachers we've had this week, and I know the the preachers we run with, they feel every word that they preach. They believe it. There was a preacher, a young guy, and and he was a little discouraged because there was a, in the community, there was a guy that was retired from the theater, and he would go to community functions and they'd get him to recite poetry or they'd get him to recite parts of plays, and he would just literally keep people spellbound, the way he could talk and the way he could connect to people. The young preacher just had a problem with this, and he was asking one of the older preachers in town about it. He says, how come every time he preaches, he gains all of their attention and he can move the audience, but when I preach, people just sit there and look at me? And the guy, the old preacher told him this. He said, he speaks fiction like it's fact, and you speak fact like it's not true, like it's fiction. Preaching should be dynamic. If I don't believe what I'm saying, I need to pack up and go back to Florida. But I'm telling you, I believe what I'm telling you. And preachers here, if you're not willing to practice what you preach, your people aren't going to follow that. It should be dynamic. Notice another thing in the text, it should be direct. This is very direct. They're causing them to take the sense. The sermon has got to be relevant and applicable. Vance Havner was an old Southern Baptist preacher. And he had a way with words. He said this, as preachers, he said, it's not our business to make the message acceptable, but to make it available. We are not to see that they like it, but that they get it. It's to be direct. There's no need to beat around the bush here. You need to consecrate your life to Jesus Christ. You need to get the rubbish out. You've got to build these walls around, and you've got to work on that inner place in there, that place where it's you and Jesus Christ. Direct preaching. 
But it's also descriptive preaching. Uh, descriptive preaching helps get the point across. That's why we try to use examples. Some of these guys did great jobs in these sermons with painting a picture of some of the Bible stories. I love that. That's great. That helps you vividly see it. That's why we use illustrations. And preaching should be comfortable enough to the ear and easy enough to listen to. Sometimes what we do is we put a little bit, you know, when you have to take medicine, you put a little bit of sugar in there. And you help it go down a little bit. So. But sometimes we try to preach and we try to say some things to try to help you swallow it. Because we're giving you some medicine. As a Christian, your job is to take your medicine. Now as preachers, we're trying to get you to take your medicine. It's descriptive. And we're going to try to describe it to the best of our way. I want to give something a little humorous here. These are the types of sermons or types of preachers. Maybe you've heard this before. And maybe you know of some, and maybe you'll point out which one I am. I don't know, probably so. There's the Texas bull. There's a point here and there, and a lot of bull in between. There's the, there's the rocking horse preacher. He's back and forth and going nowhere. And so we see in the Word of God, and we learn that we're getting sleepy. And as I keep reading, and this sing-song voice, I know that Jesus loves me, and you're not listening to a word that I'm saying. There's the mockingbird preacher. The mockingbird preacher. There's nothing new or fresh. He's just repeating everything he said. Hey, you know, we need, we need some prophets. Prophets that get their own vision from God. Look, I know you got to get you glean stuff. I glean stuff from all over the place, but you, you know you go out there and you get your you get your milk from all these sources, but then you churn your own butter. Amen. Amen. Yes. So there's the uh, mockingbird preacher. Then the smorgasbord, smorgasbord preacher. A little bit of everything, but nothing solid. <laughs> A little bit of everything, but nothing solid. Then you got the Jericho preacher. March around the subject seven times before he gets there. <laughs> Just say what you're going to say. Spit it out. <laughs> hey, then contrary to that, you got the porcupine tree preacher. He gets right to the point. <laughs> porcupine preacher. And finally, and I know there's many more, finally you got the chicken with his head cut off. Once you think the sermon's done, he jumps off and takes off in another direction. <laughs> You know, preaching is to be uh, descriptive. And I want to say this, and don't be offended by this. In some way, preaching has to be entertaining. In other yes. words, we try to captivate your mind. Yes. And well, I'm not going to get up here and open up with a, you know, a clip from a movie. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. If my preaching's that poor where I've got to bring in screens and movies, oh. I need to quit. Yeah. And if you're that sorry of a listener that you can't look at me standing up here even if I don't walk around, right. you need to just... I don't know, stand up or something. Hey, amen. Let me sit and you stand up. There was a young preacher and he asked a preacher, uh, another preacher that had heard some of his sermons, he said, hey, did I preach too long? And the friend's response says, you didn't preach too long, but you talked too much after you got done preaching. <laughs> He just kept going on and on and on. But you know, we can all criticize that. And let me say this, it's a lot easier when you're sitting there to criticize what's going on here. And so I do appreciate you listeners for having grace with us preachers. And, uh, but preaching is very important. And so not only does it need to be dynamic, direct, descriptive, but it needs to be doctrinal. D. Martin Lloyd-Jones, uh, D. Martin Lloyd-Jones, he took over after G. Campbell Morgan, the Westminster pulpit, and he said preaching should be theology on fire. Preaching should be theology on fire. So good preaching will have some Bible teaching in it. And I'm telling you this, good teaching will have some preach to it. My youth director told me, I asked him how it went last night, and he says he was teaching, you know, through some judgments. And he said, well, I got a little preachy. I said, that's all right. Yeah. It's good that you get a little preachy. Yeah. If a preacher don't get a little preachy, there's something wrong with it. Come on, yes. 
your teaching, sometimes it ought to get a little preachy. And that's good. It ought to be doctrinal. Preaching should be devotional, obviously. But look, we are to preach the Word with all long suffering and doctrine. If you don't have doctrine, your foundation is going to fall through. So, if you want to consecrate your life and you really want to take this to the next level, you're going to have to expose yourself to good, straight, hard Bible preaching. I never get tired of it. It never grows old. Number two, preaching is communication from God. In chapter number nine, we have one of the greatest prayers in the Bible. As a matter of fact, it's easy to remember. Ezra 9, Nehemiah 9, Daniel 9. They're all three great Old Testament prayers. Ezra 9, Nehemiah 9, Daniel 9. And here we have... Consecration, not just through uh, preaching, but through penitence. And when I say penitence, I'm not talking about penance like Roman Catholicism. But penitence has to do with repentance. It's a repentive attitude. This is confession to God. Look in chapter 9, verse 1. Now on the twenty and fourth day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting and with sackcloths and earth upon them. And the seed of Israel separated themselves from all strangers and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in their place. There's that place we've been talking about the whole time. And read in the book of the law of the Lord their God one fourth part of the day and another fourth part They confessed and worshipped the Lord their God. There's illumination. Illumination. God gives light. You're supposed to respond to that preaching. You're supposed to respond to that Word of God. And if you want to be better instead of bitter, if you want to grow instead of shrink and fall back, if you want to go forward instead of backwards, then you're going to have to respond to the preaching. There's illumination, that light. God gives the light. And then there's evaluation. You judge yourself by that light. And then there's contrition. There's a feeling of being exposed. The feeling of being exposed. And that leads to confession. The result of being exposed to God. This is people being serious here in chapter number 9. Not just lip service, you know. Sometimes in our prayers we get so used to saying certain things. Lord, please forgive me. Lord, please forgive me. Forgive you for what? Be specific. What is that besetting sin? What is that hang up? What is that thing that's in your place that's actually taking the place where Jesus is supposed to be in the Holy of Holies on the mercy seat? What have you put in place of Jesus? Be specific. Contrition. One man, he'd stand up and he was always asked to dismiss the service and he'd pray and ask God's blessing and he'd always say, "And Lord, please remove the cobwebs out of my ears. Lord, please remove the cobwebs out of my ears. In Jesus' name, amen. He did this all the time. Week in, week out, month in, month out. Finally, one guy got sick and tired of the ritualism. You know, the Bible talks about vain repetition. It's okay to have a prayer that's a good prayer that's repetitive. But vain repetition? So the guy said, he got through his little, you know, Lord, we thank thee that we're in thy house, and we've taken up the tithes to bring into the storehouse, and Lord, please bless us as we go to our respective places and bring us back here again. And Lord, please remove the cobwebs from my ears. Lord, please remove the cobwebs from my ears. The guy had all he could take. He said, Lord, while you're at it, kill the spider. Kill the spider. Let's get to the root of the problem. If you're going to get serious with God, you're going to have to deal with that place inside there that's taking the preeminence over Jesus. Amen. True penitence. There was a little girl whose brother set a trap to catch birds. He was just a mean little joker. You ever see kids that are just mean? You know, when we was kids, we'd touch, take little toads and put firecrackers in their mouth. Don't do that. That's not a good thing. It gets pretty messy. This, this, this little boy, man, he's catching these birds, you know, 
trapping these birds and playing with them and killing them and all this stuff. And the little girl, she was upset about this thing and she was crying about it. And, and then finally she's running around all happy and her mother's like, why are you all happy? I thought you was all upset. And she goes, well, I was. She says, I prayed for my brother to be a better boy. And then I prayed that his trap would not catch birds. And she goes, and then what would you do? She says, well, then I went out and I beat the trap to pieces. God says, okay, you've been praying about it, now do something about it. You serious? Gotten away from your little social friends or whoever they are, gotten away from some of that temptation that's really been holding on to you, and okay, are you really serious? Do something about it. Through preaching, number one. Through penitence, number two. That's confession to God. And number three, we've experienced this through praise. That's commendation to God, commending God, glorifying God through praise. Repentance should turn us to Jesus. Listen, instead of just turning us to ourselves again. Oftentimes when we repent and become remorseful, we get so consumed with our sorrow. The passage in Corinthians, I hope you're familiar with it, 2 Corinthians 7, he mentions godly sorrow that doesn't need to be repented of. The sorrow of the world worketh death. The devil's right beside you when you're feeling bad about your sins. He's like, yeah, you are a sinner. Yeah, you are rotten. Yeah, you are a piece of trash. You are no good. Yeah, the preacher's right. Don't you feel bad? Yeah, you ought to feel bad. And he tries to keep you there. You need to turn your eyes upon Jesus. Just like the song with the sins. And He will take the burden of your sins away. The Bible says if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He's faithful and just. That's a legal term. God is obligated by the very nature of His justice when the blood is applied to declare you Righteous. And if you're willing to acknowledge that and you come in faith and you confess your sins, He's faithful and just to forgive you. Why do you get up from the altar with your head bowed down? Why don't you get up with your altar instead of being sorrowful through your repentance? Why don't you be rejoicing that your sins have been forgiven? Don't you believe it? Are you a real Bible believer? Well, when he says, I forgive you, why don't you believe him? How would you feel if somebody told you something and, and, or, or you told somebody something and they just didn't believe you? If every time you told them something, they doubted what you said. You would be like, man, you just don't trust me or something. There's not much of a relationship if it's not built on trust. How do you expect to consecrate your fellowship with him if you don't build it on trust? And believe the Bible where you can move past the remorse to rejoicing. Notice in verse number 4, there's manifestation. Verse number 4 of chapter number 9, They cried with a loud voice unto the Lord their God. In the Scriptures, you'll find a loud voice being used either for devil worship or for Jesus worship. One of the two things. Notice there's manifestation. Notice verse number 5, there's exaltation. Look at the last part of the verse. Bless the Lord your God forever and ever. Blessed be thy glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. Notice adoration, verse number 6. Thou, even thou art Lord alone. Thou hast made heaven, the heavens of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth, and all things that are therein, the seas, and all that is therein, and thou preservest them all. And all the host of heaven worshipeth thee. Adoration. These little birds making their little chirping noises. God puts the song in their vocal cords. These trees that pull up all the water into the tree trunks and all the things take place where they're able to grow so big and tall. It's God that's feeding those trees. The air that's blowing through to carry the oxygen where you can breathe it and you can live. It comes from Almighty God. Amen. He is the Creator. Yes. Thank you. 
He is to be adored. He is to be worshipped. There's nobody like Him. He's irresistible. Amen. There's manifestation. There's exaltation. There's adoration. Verse number 6, there's realization. This thing hits them like a ton of bricks. Thou and thou art Lord alone. And then they begin to see in verses 7 and 8 and 9, they begin to realize this God that is the true God is our God. Not only do I belong to Jesus, but Jesus belongs to me. He's not just the beloved. He's my beloved. He's my God. You know what? This, This is the King James Bible, but it's not. This is my Bible. It's got my name on it. This is mine. You know what Paul said after many years of preaching the gospel? He says, it's my gospel. My gospel. It's my Jesus. It's my Savior. It's my new Jerusalem. There's some ownership there. This God that we talk about that's so great, that's so irresistible, that's so good. Everything about God is good. When you study God's attributes, God's not stronger in one area or the other. Everything about God is true in every way. In other words, His love is manifest in everything His does. He does. His justice is manifest in everything He does. All across the board. So when we think about God and how great He is, He belongs to us. It blows my mind. Look in verse number 17. When they're recounting the history, they make a comment here. He says, They refused to obey, neither were mindful of thy wonders. So what takes place when this passage recounts the history of Israel? And we don't have time to go through the whole deal. But what they're going to do is look back on all these things that God did for Israel. And that is being mindful of God's wonders. That's amazing to look back and see what God did in the Bible, isn't it? I mean, I like, I'm preaching through, kind of teaching, preaching through the life of Christ. Just not very deep, but just hitting some highlights. And you see that Jesus does some amazing miracles and wonders. 38, some, something like 38 miracles recorded in the Gospels. And of course, He did many more than that. He healed many blind people. He healed many lepers. John said if we, we, we wouldn't have time to write everything that He did. But you think about those wonders. He did all those things to authenticate who He was. And we have that all through the Bible. And we can look at that and thank God for that. But you know what? There's some wonders that He's done in your life. And sometimes it'll do you good when you're maybe down in the mully grubs, maybe when you're down in the dumps, maybe when you're doing all things with murmurings and disputings, you know, and you got a little aches and pains, and you got a little sorrow, maybe a little disappointment, maybe a little hurt feelings, or maybe whatever it might be, and you're down in the dumps. Maybe you're kind of like Paul and Silas, and you're in the jail, and you're in the prison, and you begin to pray. Because you're supposed to pray. Oh, I think Silas probably started off and he's like, Lord, we're just trying to serve you. Look what happened. Here we are. We love you, but man, it sure stinks in here. So I think Paul might take over and say, Silas, let me pray a little bit. Lord, we're thankful (laughs) that we're not dead. We're thankful that we still have some food in our bellies from yesterday. We're thankful that we're alive. Lord, we're thankful that you saved us. We're thankful that we're going to heaven one day. We're thankful that you gave Jesus to be our sacrifice. And we're thankful that for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. We're thankful for God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. And he goes on and on and on. and Maybe he gets in there and says, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart that God hath raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that jailer comes in after the whole thing busts up and says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. You know, 
you start with the mully grubs, just start, like you said, count your blessings. Count your blessings. If I got and you got what you truly deserved, you would be in everlasting darkness right now. The fire that can burn a soul but not consume it, that would be you right now. He says in Ezra, He has punished us less than our iniquities deserve. So when you get the mother grubs, you need to look at this and be mindful of His wonders. And as they look, verse number 7, there's the wonder of His choosing. God chose Abram. And we know, of course, when you deal with the election, we obviously have a national application to the people of God in the Old Testament, which is the nation of Israel. The people of God in the New Testament church age is the body of Christ. Two different people under two different testaments. And so you want to understand that we can make application here, and you think about it. You know what? I am part of that body of Jesus Christ. What a blessing. The wonder of it all. I could have been born in Saudi Arabia. I didn't choose to be born in the South. My dad got saved the year I was born. And he's the man that led me to Christ. What's the chances of that? And you know, some of you know my testimony. How did my dad get saved? Well, he got saved on a Sunday, I believe it was. My mother got saved on a Tuesday visitation. She got saved on Tuesday, went to church, Tuesday or Thursday, went to church that Sunday, and then my dad got saved. That set in motion me standing here. I could have been born in China somewhere. I could have been born in some home where the parent... I I had no choice in that deal. Look, I'm just telling you, sometimes you got to back up and realize there are many mysteries that we're never going to understand. But we have to sometimes be consumed at the wonder of it all. The wonder of His choosing. Verse 7, notice verse number 8, the wonder of His covenant. He made a covenant. Here's the deal with us. You know the covenant that's between you and God? It really isn't between you and God. The covenant that you're involved in is between... God and His Son, Jesus Christ. You remember that Old Testament passage about Mephibosheth? Okay, David, of course, became king. And David had a friend named Jonathan, who was the son of Saul. And David and Jonathan made a covenant. And Jonathan said, look, I know you're the guy, and I might be next to you one day, but I tell you what, don't cut off my seed. Don't cut off my descendants. David said, I promise, I'll make a covenant between me and you forever. Well, when David becomes king, normally what happens when a monarch would take the throne, they would destroy any threat of the old monarch from coming back. And so the general idea would be that you would destroy any descendant of the previous king or any future descendants it might be. So Mephibosheth is down in a place called Lodabar. Lodabar. And David sent his chariots to go fetch Mephibosheth. And when those chariots came to fetch Mephibosheth, I don't know if you know anything about Mephibosheth or not, but the Bible tells us that he was crippled from a fall. (laughs) You see, something had happened that messed him up for his entire life. And he couldn't just run and escape. He was basically a sitting duck. And here comes those big chariots out there, and here comes David's men, and they're knocking on the door. And for all practical purposes, maybe he thinks, okay, this is it. They're coming to get me. The new monarch is coming to get me. I'm one of the descendants. I'm in this, I'm in this bad covenant here, and he's going to come take me, and I'm done. Those big soldiers come in there, and they probably just literally pick him up like some of you guys were carrying each other around here. They picked him up, <laughs> carried him out, and take him off. He has no idea what's going on. He's probably just shaking in his pants there. and They bring him and drop him down there before David and he's probably just shaking. And instead of finding judgment, he finds mercy. He says, why should thou take knowledge of such a dead dog as I am? And he finds grace. Why? Because of a covenant between David and Jonathan. He says, is there any left of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness to him? And then he says, the kindness of God. 
The Bible says, but after that, the kindness of God our Savior toward man appeared. Not by works of righteousness, which we've done, but according to His mercy, He saved us. By the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. It's because of Jesus Christ you're saved. You're not saved because you're somebody. God didn't look down and say, you know what? I'm going to put you on my team. I want you. I think you could be a great team player. You would be a great contributor and you would just make heaven shine that much better. You're such a great person and you're so filled. No, 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 no. He looked down and saw a cripple, lame, defiled, smelly, stinking, rotten sinner from the wrong side of the tracks. And because of His covenant with His Son, Jesus Christ, the one who, like the brother said, said, hey, I want her. (laughs) Because of that covenant and His mercy, He found you. The wonder of His covenant And boy, the blood of Jesus Christ. Hey, if the blood of bulls and goats sanctifies the purifying of the flesh, how much more the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without spot, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living and true God. Boy, we're in on a good, better covenant. The precious, spotless blood of Jesus Christ. The wonder of His choosing, the wonder of His covenant... Verse number 9, the wonder of his concern. Thou didst see the affliction of our fathers in Egypt and heardest their cry by the Red Sea. You know, um, you ever think about how busy the Lord must be? There's a lot of people praying. That's a lot lot of prayers to answer. But he thinks about us. And he's concerned about us. Sometimes in my pettiness and my stupid depravity and my stupid, uh, I don't know if I want to call call it a a, a sissified handicap or whatever it may be, I think, Lord, why should you even care about me? You've done everything for me. I've hardly done anything for you. And here I come again asking for more help. The Lord says, that's okay. Casting all your care upon me, he says, for our care for you. The wonder of his concern. Verse number 9. He heard their cry. Go ahead and cry those tears. You know what he does with those tears? I heard some of those tears. I was down here praying after Brother Gorski's message. I heard some of these folks crying. So what does God do? He takes those tears and he puts them in his bottle. You go ahead and cry those tears. The Lord hears it. The wonder of His choosing, the wonder of His covenant, the wonder of His concern. He's such a magnifical God, like that word used about the temple. Magnifical. And here He is in His majesty and His glory, and He takes time to care about us. The wonder of His conquering, verses 10 and 11. He showed signs and wonders. Verse number 11, He divided the Red Sea. You know the story of the Exodus, the wonder of His conquering. Think about the things He's brought you through. Think about the Red Seas in your life that He parted to get you where you are right now. Then notice verses 12 and 13, the wonder of His communion. He brings you out of Egypt so He can have communion and fellowship with you. Moses told Pharaoh, look, we can't sacrifice in the land. Pharaoh tried to compromise just like Tobiah will try to compromise with you. Tobiah will say, look, let's have the mosque of Omar and the temple of the Jews. Tobiah will say, look, you go ahead and have your little summer camp as long as I can have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. You have your little Sundays, but let me have the rest of the week. Pharaoh said, look, why don't you just sacrifice in the land? Moses says, nope. We've got to come out from among them and be you separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And so he brought them out to commune. He's built the wall around the city the last few days. He's removed the rubbish so you can finally commune without interruption. So you can have a clear signal where you can have a real connection. Notice his communion in verses 12 and 13. There's a, uh, his conducting in verse number 12. He led them. Sometimes the reason you don't see God's hand and you can't see where He's leading you is because there's too much, uh, there's too much rubbish in the way. Sometimes it's because there's, there's too much uh, fog there. There's too much stuff, uh, 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 humidity on the windshield. Notice he's conducting, he's leading them in the pillar of fire by, um, 
day by night and a pillar of cloud by day. Notice not just his conducting, but his commands in verse number 14. He made known his holy Sabbath and his commands. You do what you're supposed to do today, and the God will give you the commands for tomorrow. Don't be so bent out of shape trying to figure out what you're going to be doing in five, ten years. You do, like one of the preachers said, you got light for right here. You take that light and you take that, that step in that light. Yes. Yeah. And God will lead you one simple step at a time. Amen. Sufficient to the day is the evil thereof, Jesus said. Notice his conducting. Notice his command. Look in verse, verse 15. Notice his cuisine. He gave them bread from heaven for hunger and brought us them forth water out of the rock for their thirst and promised them they should go and possess the land. He gave them bread and water. Bread and water. God will feed you. Finally, let me say this and we'll wrap it up. We've got the preaching. We've got the penitence. We've got the praise. Your commendation toward God. Now we have in chapter 9, the last part of it, in chapter 10, we have promises made. When they get done with all of this, the leaders get around. Verse number 38, look, they made a sure covenant and they wrote it and they sealed it up and put their names on it. Chapter 10, if you come down, we won't read all the names and get to the end of the thing. But verse number 29 of chapter 10, they claved to their brethren, their nobles, and entered into a curse and into an oath to walk in God's law, which was given by Moses, servant of God, and to observe and to do all the commandments of the Lord our Lord and His judgments and his statutes. There are promises to make. This has to do with a commitment to obey God. A commitment to obey God. God gets you in that place. We have exploration. Exploration. What is that? That's a review of what God did. We even have anticipation. We get a glimpse of what God's going to do. Boy, don't that give us encouragement, man? Especially when you see what I believe are the beginning stages of a collapse of this empire. The United States empire. I believe we're going to see it collapse financially. We've already seen it collapse morally and spiritually. It just has to happen. But you know what? I'm not looking for this. I'm looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior. We have anticipation. We have exploration to see what God did. That encourages us because, you know, you think sometimes God can't do something, then God will remind you what He did in the past. Well, if He can do that back then, then why do I have to doubt Him that He can do it now? Yes. And then we have anticipation. We can look at what God's going to do. But with all of that, it brings us to resolution. Remember, we're consecrating our place. We're presenting our bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to the Lord, which is our reasonable service. Resolution. D.L. Moody, the great preacher, said this. He said, Paul said in Philippians, this one thing I do, not these many things I dabble with. Okay. What will happen is, your mind's stuffed, your heart's exploding. The devil's always going to try to divert you. And he'll try to get you over here and over there and over there and over here and over here. You need to fine-tune it. Yes. That's why I don't give you all these specifics and tell you, you need to take this type of job. And you need to buy this type of vehicle. And you need to marry this person. And you need to do this and do this and do this. We can give you some generals, but... In that book and in prayer, God the Holy Spirit is going to give you some specifics. This one thing I do. You've got that place of fellowship where Jesus needs to be at home. Where He needs to be comfortable. Where He needs to be exalted. Where self needs to decrease and He needs to increase. You take a river. And if a river it has real narrow banks, the current will be super strong. But if a river, I've seen the Mississippi at a couple different spots, and the Mississippi, especially when it gets down to form the Delta area, it spreads way, way out. And once that, the banks are spread way, way out, there's no force anymore. And you think you've got to get over here and do this, and you've got to get over here and do that, and you think that's going to please the Lord, and you think that's going to please the Lord, but really, you're actually watching all these people and you're doing these things that all these other people are doing. You need to narrow it down to you and Jesus Christ and something specific He's led you to do. 
this one thing I do. Are you ready to be serious? Can you, can you really say, I present my body a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God? Consecration. I don't know how much new vehicles are. I know some of those trucks are seventy and eighty thousand dollars. I couldn't buy one of those. But can you imagine? Let's say you were going to buy a new car. Let's say it's forty-five thousand dollars. Let's say you go in and you order this car. A lot of times you have to order them now. And so you go ahead and pay everything in full. Forty-five thousand dollars in full. You keep calling the sales guy. And you're like, "Hey, when can I pick up my car?" And the guy's like, "Well, we're a little back. You know, everything's behind. <laughs> it's going to be a couple weeks. You know." So you wait, you wait, you call him. He goes, well, it's going to be a couple more weeks. And you keep waiting and waiting. Finally, he says, okay, it's here. Come on in. Come on in. You come in to get the car. You're all excited. You know, you've already paid. You're ready to go. And you, know, you just can't wait. And you're looking around for it. And he comes out with a box. <laughs> and he hands you this box. And you open up this box. And here's a gas cap. Here's a windshield wiper. And here's a couple hub caps. You didn't pay $45,000 for spare parts. When Jesus' precious blood was shed for you, you were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. You know what we do? We just give Him our spare parts. The offering plates pass, so we say, hmm, let's see what I got. Uh, let's see. I got a dollar. No, I'm throwing a dollar. I got a dollar left over. I'll keep the nine for myself, I'll give Him one. Just give him what I got left over. Well, I don't have anything planned. The kids don't have anything good. I think, well, we'll go out on the public ministry today. We don't have nothing else going on. Well, we'll be there. Well, you know, I don't have any overtime, so I can make it to church this week. Wow. Don't have any overtime. I can be there. Well, I'm not too busy. You know, I've got time to read a few chapters of the Bible. I'm not too busy. I, I can do that. We'll give God our spare parts. That's good conviction, brother. That's not consecration. Why did you go to all the trouble to get all that rubbish out, to put all those blocks and all those walls in place to keep the devil out and to keep all this bad stuff out if you're not going to let him have everything? I'll close with this. Some of you got married, and I'm assuming you do it kind of like we do. You'll have typically a, um, a wedding rehearsal the night before. Is that most everybody? You do a wedding rehearsal where everybody that's in the wedding party, you get there and you literally go through everything. You have the musician. They tell you when to walk down. And that, that joke, by the way, was what you do, you tell the, here's the instructions you give to the bride. Okay, you got to remember these three things that's going to help you in your, in your marriage, okay? As you walk down there, you remember you got you to walk down the aisle, then you got to walk to the altar, then you go to your bridegroom, him. Remember, I'll alter him. I'll alter him. Oh, that's good. I, people don't get it. When you get it, give me a call. <laughs> amen, amen. Right. Praise, hey, praise the Lord. <laughs> but you have this whole wedding rehearsal. You do all this stuff, you know. Then you go get to eat the food. That's the best part. And you come the next day. Now, a lot of times what I do when I go through everything and we, have the, the, we, we get them there and we get ready to do the vows, I just you know, kind of mumble a couple things. I'm, I don't even, don't even go through that. I just say, you, you know what to say and you know what to say and you're going to follow me. And we don't even put a lot of emphasis there. Because when you do the wedding rehearsal and you get all done... And you go back and you're waiting for that next day and you're butterflies and you know, you're all worried about is the photographer going to show up because everything's about the pictures. You know. My ideal wedding ceremony is this. When the photographer comes in, you have them arrested. And you get rid of the cameras. Amen and amen and amen. And when you say I do and they say I do, you go eat. Praise the Lord. And you don't sit around for three hours waiting for him to walk in. Amen, preacher. <laughs> I know you want all the pictures. But anyway, after the wedding rehearsal, they're still not married. They've gone through all the motions. 
but it's until the wedding day where they make the commitment that they're married. You know what you could have done in the past few days, past few services? You could have been going through the motions. You could have acted like you were getting the rubbish out. You could have acted like you were building up the walls. You could have acted like you were saying no to the sand ballot and Tobiah and those guys. You could have just went through some motions. But you've got to make the commitment. We're too, it's too late in the game for us to play games with God. It's too late. It's time to consecrate. No telling what the Lord can do. D.L. Moody, I quoted him earlier. If you don't know who he is, look him up. He led millions of people to Christ. Great, great evangelist in his day. He became a preacher because he surrendered. He heard somebody say, the world is yet to see what God can do with one man that is fully surrendered. When he heard that preacher say that, you know what he said? He goes, by God's grace, I'm going to be that man. There's no telling what God could do if we were fully committed in consecration to Him. Amen? Let's pray.